The Traitor's Kiss, 26, 47 to 56, 15 And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever is Hall Kiss, he is the one, seize him. And immediately he went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword, and struck the slave of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must happen this way? At that time Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. 26, 47-56 Besides Jesus, the participants in this narrative are the mixed crowd that came to arrest him, the traitor Judas, and the eleven disciples. The crowd attacked Jesus, Judas betrayed him with a kiss, Peter presumptuously tried to defend him with a sword, and the disciples defected from him in terror. But amidst those tragic activities, all of which appeared to work toward Jesus' disgrace and defeat, the undaunted majesty and triumph of the Saviour continued to manifest themselves as God's prophetic word was unerringly fulfilled. The attack of the crowd and while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and elders of the people. 26, 47 while Jesus was still speaking to the eleven disciples in the garden, admonishing them to be spiritually vigilant and announcing to them his imminent betrayal, vv. 45-46, Behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up. It seems strange and inappropriate that Judas would still be called one of the twelve while he was in the very act of betrayal. One would think Matthew would have been loath to refer to him in such a way. By the time the Gospels were written, Judas's name had long been a byword among Christians, a synonym for treachery and infamy. Why, we might wonder, was he not referred to as the false disciple or the one who counted himself among the twelve? But, in fact, all four Gospel writers specifically speak of Judas as one of the twelve, Matt. 26, 14, 47, Mark 14, 10, 20, 43, Luke 22. 47, John 6, 71, whereas no other disciple is individually designated in that way. The writers clearly identify Judas as the betrayer of Jesus, but they do not speak of him with overt disdain or hatred. They are remarkably restrained in their descriptions and assessments of him, never using derogatory epithets or fanciful episodes, as did many extra-biblical writers. The apocryphal writing the story of Joseph of Arimathea taught that Judas was the son of the brother of the high priest Caiaphas and that he was sent by Caiaphas to infiltrate the disciples and discover a way to destroy Jesus. According to another apocryphal writing, the Acts of Pilate, Judas went home after the betrayal and found his wife roasting a chicken. When he told her he was planning to kill himself because he was afraid Jesus would rise from the dead and take vengeance on him. She replied that Jesus would no more rise from the dead than the chicken she was cooking would jump out of the fire and crow at which instant the chicken was said to have done just that. An ancient manuscript called Coptic Narratives of the Ministry and Passion maintained that Judas's wife was exceedingly greedy and that he was nothing more than the pawn of a manipulative wife. In the ancient Near East, to accuse a man of being subjugated to a dominating wife was considered highly slanderous. A twelfth Century writing called the legendary aura claimed that Judas's parents threw him into the sea when he was an infant, because even at that early age they supposedly sensed he was diabolical and deserved to be destroyed. Somehow he managed to survive and grow to adulthood, and, 
according to the legend, soon after marrying a beautiful older woman, he discovered she was his mother. Such bizarre accounts are common in extra-biblical literature. They are concocted to demonstrate the vileness of Judas and to reveal the contempt with which he was viewed. The Gospel writers, by contrast, simply call him one of the twelve. Rather than minimizing the heinousness of Judas' treachery, this heightens the insidiousness of his crime more than any list of epithets could do. When the traitor came to the garden, he was accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and elders of the people. This great multitude was not the typical spontaneous crowd of admirers that often sought him out. It was rather a carefully, selected group brought together for the sole purpose of arresting him and putting him to death. The multitude included officers of the temple, Luke 22, 52, who were granted limited police powers by the Romans in matters concerning Jewish religion and society. This group was probably armed with clubs. The multitude also included a cohort of Roman soldiers, John 18, 3, which, at full strength, comprised 600 men. Because they had to have Roman permission to exercise the death penalty, the Jewish leaders had requested Roman soldiers to join in the arrest. These soldiers from Fort Antonia in Jerusalem, and perhaps some of the temple police as well, were armed with swords. The soldiers probably were also included because on a previous occasion when the temple police were sent to arrest Jesus, they came back empty-handed, John 7, 32, 44-46. Apparently the Jewish leaders had intended for some time to accuse Jesus of rebellion against Rome. In that way his death could be blamed on the Roman government, and they themselves would be safe from reprisal by the many Jews who as yet still admired him. In order to take advantage of the opportunity, the chief priests and elders must have hurried to Pilate to request the immediate use of his troops. Or perhaps they previously had arranged with the governor to have the soldiers available on short notice. Under intimidation because he did not want to risk another insurrection, especially in the midst of an important Jewish feast, see Mark 15, 6-7, the Roman governor granted the request. When he left the upper room, Judas must have rushed to meet with the Jewish leaders and inform them that the propitious time they had been waiting for was at hand. Although Judas's original arrangement had been only with the chief priests and other temple officials, Luke 22, 4. The Pharisees also became involved in the plot, John 18, 3, as did the Sadducees and the entire Sanhedrin, Mark 15, 1, Acts 23, 6. And because the multitude not only included representatives from the chief priests and elders but the chief priests and elders themselves, Luke 22, 52, those leaders obviously wanted to make sure Jesus did not overpower them or slip through their fingers again. When all four Gospel accounts are compared, it becomes evident that the total number of men who came with Judas to the Garden may have been as high as a thousand. That mixed multitude was a prophetic portrait of the world's treatment of Christ, a vivid illustration of its wickedness, mindlessness, and cowardice. Instead of humbly welcoming the Son of God, embracing their long, awaited Messiah, and falling at His feet in adoration and worship, they arrogantly came to put Him to death. Their wicked intent was manifest first of all in the gross injustice of their accusations and actions, which had no relation to truth or justice. Jesus had broken neither Mosaic nor Roman law. He had committed no immoral or illegal act. His only offense was in not recognizing or obeying the man, made, legalistic rabbinical traditions. Pilate had no love or respect for Jesus, but he acknowledged he was not guilty of breaking any Roman law much less of inciting a rebellion, John 19, 4. Yet to protect his own position with Rome and to keep from arousing the discontent of the Jewish leaders, he was perfectly willing to allow an innocent man to be executed. Second, the multitude not only was unjust but mindless. The majority of them probably had little idea of what they were doing or of the reasons for it. The Roman soldiers, of course, were simply obeying orders as they were trained to do, without questioning the purpose or propriety. Most of those in the multitude had no personal grudge against Jesus, and some of them probably had never heard of him before. 
yet they had no compunction about participating in his arrest. In their spiritual darkness they had no ability to recognize Jesus as the very source and incarnation of truth and righteousness. In any case, they cared little for truth, righteousness, or anything else of spiritual value, but only for their personal welfare. Most of them were hirelings who were indifferent to the justice of what they did as long as they were paid and did not get into trouble with their superiors. That multitude has had counterparts in every age of church history. Countless millions have been incited against the cause of Christ without having the least notion of who he is or of what he taught. They become willing victims of someone else's ungodly prejudice and join in causes that are patently unjust. A third characteristic of the multitude in the garden was cowardice. Not only the leaders, but probably the soldiers and temple police as well, preferred to arrest Jesus in this dark, isolated place rather than in the streets of Jerusalem in broad daylight. A riotous mob can be intimidating even to armed men. And despite the advantages of darkness and isolation, the cowardly, apprehensive leaders felt it necessary to bring a thousand men, including several hundred armed soldiers, to arrest a dozen men who were known to be peaceful. A guilty conscience always produces cowardice. The wicked fear they may receive justice for their injustice and therefore seek protection in numbers and in darkness. They are afraid of exposure and opposition, and they take no public stand or action unless the odds are overwhelmingly in their favor. The multitude was also profane. What an unbelievable sacrilege was committed that night by the murderous, sinful men who dared to lay hands on the sinless Son of God. The unbelieving world has always disdained the name of God, the word of God, and the things of God. No pagan deity is so openly blasphemed by mankind as is the Lord Jesus Christ. Few evidences testify more boldly that the world is now in the hands of Satan than the fact that it is the true God who is most often blasphemed and mocked. The kiss of the traitor now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I shall kiss, he is the one, seize him. And immediately he went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. 26, 48, 50a, Judas had left the upper room after dark, John 13, 30, and gone directly to the chief priests, with whom he had already consummated the agreement to betray Jesus for thirty pieces of silver, Mat. 26, 14-16. He had been looking for a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the multitude, Luke 22, 6, and now was the ideal time. Judas rightly surmised that Jesus would later go to the Garden of Gethsemane, see John 18, 2, which was well away from the crowds of Jerusalem. Pilgrims thronged the streets throughout most of the night during this high time of Passover week, when the two days of sacrifice overlapped, see Chap. 12 of this volume. Only in darkness and in such a remote place as this could they take Jesus captive without arousing attention. Judas was severely disappointed that Jesus did not turn out to be the kind of Messiah he expected. Jesus did not overthrow Rome or even the powerful Jewish religious leaders, and consequently he had acquired no positions of prestige and power with which to reward his disciples. Instead of teaching them how to conquer and control. Control. Jesus taught them how to submit and serve. Instead of Judas's being richer than when he began to follow Jesus, it is quite likely he was poorer except for the money he stole from the group's treasury, John 12, 6. Judas was already possessed by Satan, Luke 22, 3, and therefore what he did was no longer under his control. Yet it was under the compulsion of his own unbelief, greed, and ambition that he had opened himself to Satan's presence. Delivering up Jesus was in the mind of Satan, the mind of Judas, the minds of the Jewish religious leaders, and in the mind of Rome. But it was in the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God ages before it entered the mind of Satan or the minds of those godless men, Acts 2, 23. Even while doing Satan's business, Judas and his CEO, conspirators were being used to fulfill a divinely ordained plan that would result in the salvation of sinners like the very ones set on killing him. Because it was dark and because many in the multitude probably did not know Jesus by sight, Judas, 
the one who was betraying him, had prearranged a sign, saying, Whomever I shall kiss, he is the one, seize him. Kisses from file, a verb referring to an act of special respect and affection, much as is still displayed today in many Arab cultures and even among some Europeans. In the ancient Near East such a kiss was a sign of homage. Because of his lowly status, a slave would kiss the feet of his master or other not able person, as would an enemy seeking mercy from a monarch. Ordinary servants would perhaps kiss the back of the hand of the one they greeted, and those above the level of servant would sometimes kiss the palm of the hand. To kiss the hem of a person's garment was a sign of reverence and devotion. But an embrace and a kiss on the cheek was the sign of close affection and love, reserved only for those with whom one had a close, intimate relationship. A kiss and embrace were an accepted mark of affection of a pupil for his teacher, for example, but only if the teacher offered them first. Therefore, of all the signs Judas could have selected, he chose the one that would turn out to be the most despicable, not because of the act itself but because he perverted it so hypocritically and treacherously. He could have pointed out Jesus in countless other ways that would have been just as effective. For whatever debauched reason he may have had, Judas chose to feign his innocence and affection before Jesus and the disciples to the very end. It is hard to imagine that even so wicked a person as Judas could have flagrantly displayed his treachery in the very face of the one who had graciously taught and befriended him for three years. But Satan, who filled him, knows no embarrassment and has no restraint on his wretchedness. The raucous cries of the crowd to crucify him must have been painful to Jesus' ears. He had taught them, healed them, and offered them the very bread of life, and yet they had turned against him in contempt and derision. Even the hatred of the chief priests, elders, Pharisees, and Sadducees was painful to him, because he loved and would have redeemed even those wicked men. The brutality of the soldiers who would beat him, spit on him, and place a crown of thorns on his head was painful to Jesus' spirit as well as his body. Even the cowardly indifference of Pilate would wound Jesus' heart, because he came to forgive and to save even that pagan Gentile. But Judas must have wounded Jesus more grievously than all the others together, because he had been a disciple and friend, an intimate with whom Jesus unreservedly had shared his love, his companionship, and his truth. It is impossible to imagine what our Lord must have felt when Judas brashly approached him and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. Yet his grief was not for himself but for this man who was so engulfed by greed and self will that he would stoop to betray the dearest friend he ever had or could have. Kiss translates an intensified form of the verb used in verse 48a and he carries the idea of fervent, continuous expression of affection. It was the word used by Luke of the woman who came into the Pharisee's house and kissed Jesus' feet, wiping them with her hair and anointing them with perfume, Luke 7, 38, 45. It was also used by Luke to describe the father's reception of the repentant son in the parable of the prodigal, 15, 20, and of the grieving Ephesian elders on the beach near Miletus as they bade farewell to their beloved Paul, Acts 20, 37. It was just such intense affection that Judas feigned for Christ. Judas was so caught up in his deceitful display that even Jesus' sobering words, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Luke 22, 48, did not deter him. It is probable that Judas was now so much under Satan's domination that his actions were no longer voluntary. In deep sadness, but with perfect composure in the face of Judas's perfidy, Jesus said simply, Friend, do what you have come for. The Lord did not use the usual word, philos, for friend, which he used of the twelve in John 15, 14. Instead he addressed Judas merely as Hitiros, which is better translated fellow, comrade, or companion. Jesus had offered himself to be Judas's friend, and more than that, to be his savior. But the opportunity for salvation had passed, and in light of Judas's unspeakable treachery, even fellow was a gracious form of address. Do what you have come for was Jesus' farewell statement to the son of perdition. For Judas those were the last words of Christ, and one can imagine that the words will ring as a torment in his ears throughout all eternity in hell. Judas exposed himself outwardly as the enemy of Christ he had always been inwardly, 
and until the end of history his name will be synonymous with treachery. Judas's betrayal not only reflected the wickedness of the sinful world but the wretchedness of the false disciple. He is the epitome of a sham believer, the quintessence of a spurious Christian. A false Christian is first of all motivated by self, interest, which for Judas was exhibited most obviously in his greed, because he was a thief, John 12, 6. But it is likely that he also craved prestige, glory, and power, which he expected to share with Jesus when he overthrew Rome and established his earthly kingdom. He sought to use Jesus for his own sinful ends, and when he discovered that the Lord would not be so used, he turned on him in open rejection and betrayal. He was like the seeds planted in rocky soil that spring up for a little while but wither when exposed to the heat of the sun, Matt. 13, 5-6 When disappointment and testing came, he fell away, cvv 20-21. He is the fruitless branch that is cut off and burned, John 15, 6. Second, a false disciple is also marked by deceit and hypocrisy. He masquerades in the guise of devotion to Christ, his word, and his church. He is like a tear planted among wheat, only God can with certainty distinguish him from the real thing. He pays homage to Christ on the outside but hates him on the inside. Like Judas, his outward signs of affection for the Lord cover a heart that despises him. But when a false believer is confronted with a price to pay for his association with Christ, his superficial interest in the church and the things of God invariably withers, and he is exposed as the impostor he has always been. Judas's particular act of betrayal and its direct consequences were unique, but his basic attitude toward Jesus is characteristic of every false believer. Every age has found Judases in the church, those who outwardly feign allegiance to Christ but who at heart are his enemies. They identify themselves with the church for many different reasons but all of the reasons are self, serving. Whether it is to get ahead in business by appearing respectable, to gain social acceptance by being religious, to salve a guilty conscience by means of pretended righteousness, or to accomplish any other purpose, the underlying motive always is to serve and please self, not God. Judas is the archetype of Christ rejectors and the supreme example of wasted privilege and opportunity. He is the picture of those who love money having forsaken the priceless Son of God for thirty pieces of silver, cf. Matt 13, 22. He is the classic hypocrite, who feigned love and loyalty for Christ even as he delivered him up for execution. He is the supreme false disciple, the son of Satan who masquerades as a son of God. The presumption of Peter then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword, and struck the slave of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? 26, 50b, 53, As soon as he was identified by Judas, the soldiers came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. When they saw their master being arrested, the disciples asked, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Luke 22, 49 But one of those who were with Jesus did not wait for a reply but reached and drew out his sword, and struck the slave of the high priest, and cut off his ear. As we might guess, this act was performed by the impulsive and volatile Peter, John 18, 10, who obviously was one of the two disciples who had armed themselves, Luke 22, 38. It may have been that the synoptic writers did not identify Peter because their Gospels were written earlier than John's, when Peter could have been in danger of reprisal from the Jewish authorities. John also informs us that the man Peter struck was named Malchus, John 18, 10, who, because he was in the forefront of the multitude, was probably a high, ranking slave of the high priest. Peter doubtlessly had aimed for Malchus's head but cut off only his ear when the man ducked. Peter probably was emboldened by the fact that a few moments earlier when Jesus told the multitude who he was, they drew back, and fell to the ground, John 18, 6. 
Seizing that time of vulnerability, Peter perhaps thought he would kill as many as he could before he himself was slain. Or perhaps he assumed he was invincible, thinking that Jesus would not allow himself or his disciples to be harmed. As was often the case, however, Peter reacted in the wrong way. When the Lord had told the disciples, let him who has no sword sell his robe and buy one, Luke 22, 36, he was speaking of spiritual, not physical, preparedness. As Jesus had made clear many times, and as Paul later declared to the Corinthian church, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, 2 cor. 10, 4. The church has never made advances by physical warfare, and every time it has tried, the cause of Christ has been severely harmed. There are no holy wars. Every war fought in the name of Christ has been utterly unholy, contradicting and undermining everything his word teaches. The kingdom of God does not advance with fleshly weapons or by fleshly strategy. The battleground is spiritual, and it makes no sense to fight with physical weapons. Jesus told Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, that I might not be delivered up to the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm, John 18, 36. Wars such as the Crusades that are fought in the name of Christ are an affront to Christ. In reality, they are Crusades against the very one who is claimed to be served. Jesus gave Peter two important reasons that explain why the use of physical weapons cannot be used to defend, much less extend, his kingdom. First of all, to do so is fatal. Put your sword back into its place, Jesus told Peter, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Jesus was not philosophizing by declaring that everyone who takes up arms will himself be killed by arms or that a person who uses violence will be killed violently. His point was that those who commit acts of violence to achieve personal ends will face punishment by civil authorities, the sword representing a common means of execution in the ancient world. He was simply reiterating the divine standard set forth in Genesis, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man, 9, 6. To protect the sanctity of human life, God declares that the one who wantonly takes the life of another person is subject to capital punishment. God has given human government the right to execute murderers. It does not bear the sword for nothing, Paul said, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil, Rom. 13, 4. The Apostle willingly applied that law to himself. In his defense before Festus he said, if then I am a wrongdoer, and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die, Acts 25, 11. In telling Peter to put his sword back into its place Jesus was saying, in effect, no matter how wicked and unjust my arrest is, you have no right to take vigilante action. If you take a life while doing that, your own life will justly be forfeited as punishment. Jesus' arrest and subsequent trials were clearly unjust, but they were nevertheless carried out within the framework of the legal systems of that day. Although it exercised its power only by the permission of Rome, the Sanhedrin was a civil as well as religious governing body in Israel. Pilate was the duly appointed Roman governor. Jesus' point was that personal violent action against even an unjust governing body is wrong. God has the sovereign right to overrule human governments, as he has done frequently throughout history, but no individual has such a right. Jesus was not speaking about self, defense or the defense of loved ones or friends from an attacker. Nor was he talking about fighting in the armed forces of one's country. He was referring to violently taking justice into one's own hands. Under no circumstances does a Christian or anyone else have the right to dispense personal justice, even to defend Christ's name or word. Second, trying to defend Christ and his kingdom by physical force is foolish. Do you not think that I cannot appeal to my Father, Jesus said, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? Trying to defend Christ with a sword not only is morally wrong according to God's law but is also pointless. 
After having seen Jesus' divine power demonstrated hundreds of times, why did Peter think his Lord needed the puny help of one sword, or even a thousand swords? A full Roman legion was composed of six thousand soldiers. More than twelve legions of angels therefore would be in excess of seventy-two thousand. If a single angel of God could slay one hundred and eighty-five thousand men in one night, as with the Assyrian troops of Sennacherib, 2 Kings 19, 35, the power of 72,000 angels is unimaginable. Jesus explained to his impetuous disciple that he had immediate access to supernatural forces that easily could destroy the entire Roman army, not to mention the mere cohort of 600 soldiers, John 18, 3, they now faced. Peter's demonstration of self, willed bravery was therefore unnecessary and absurd. The Lord's battles are won in his power alone, and any human efforts on his behalf that are not made in submission to his divine will and strength are presumptuous and futile. The fulfillment of prophecy how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must happen this way. 26, 54 For Peter to violently oppose Jesus' arrest was also to oppose the fulfillment of God's prophesied plan of redemption. According to God's own scriptures, he reminded Peter again that it must happen this way. On at least three other occasions, see Matt. 16, 21, 17, 22 to 23, 20, 18 to 19, cf. 12, 40, 17, 9, 12, he had told the disciples that it was necessary that he suffer, die, and be raised from the dead. As David predicted, a close and trusted friend would betray the Messiah, PSS. 41, 9, 55, 12 to 14. Isaiah foretold that he would be despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Smitten of God, and afflicted. Pierced through for our transgressions. Crushed for our iniquities. Chastened for our well, being. That by his scourging we are healed. He would be oppressed, afflicted, and slaughtered like a lamb that does not cry out. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities, ISA. 53, 3-5, 7, 10-11 Because Peter boasted too loudly, prayed too little, slept too much, and acted too fast, he seemed invariably to miss the point of what Jesus was saying and doing. The Lord therefore had to explain to him again that what was happening was in God's perfect plan. Put the sword into the sheath, he said, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? John 18, 11 Then, in the only instance recorded in scripture of Jesus healing a fresh wound, he touched Malchus's ear and healed him, Luke 22, 51 in a sovereign act of miraculous grace, Jesus undid Peter's damage. The defection of the disciples at that time Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. 26, 55-56 with an overtone of sarcasm Jesus pointed up the subterfuge and cowardice of the multitudes who now confronted him in the garden. Am I so dangerous, he said to them, that you had to come out in such great numbers and with swords and clubs to arrest me as against a robber? Am I so elusive that you had to capture me by stealth in the dead of night? You know very well that every day I used to sit in the temple teaching. Why did you not seize me then? Jesus knew that no amount of truth or logic would dissuade his enemies from executing their plot against him. They knew their charges were spurious and unjust. And that they had had countless opportunities to arrest him publicly. But when evil men are determined to have their way, they will not be deterred by such considerations as truth, justice, legality, or righteousness. Jesus then told the crowd what he had just reminded Peter of. All this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Whatever your personal reasons and motivations may be, he was saying, 
you are unwittingly accomplishing what your own scriptures have said through the prophets that you would do to your Messiah. Completely apart from your own evil intentions, God is sovereignly using you to accomplish his righteous and gracious purposes. And in doing so, he will demonstrate that his infallible word through the prophets will be fulfilled. Those words obviously gave little comfort or courage to the disciples. At last it dawned on them that their Lord was finally a captive of his enemies and that he would neither do anything himself nor allow them to do anything to interfere. Although the leaders of the multitude had said they sought only Jesus, John 18, 5, the disciples were fearful they would be arrested as accomplices, and therefore all the disciples left him and fled. The little faith disciples did not trust Jesus to save them and were afraid to risk suffering and perhaps even dying with him. Just as he had predicted earlier that evening, when the shepherd was struck the sheep scattered, Matt. 26, 31. It is easy to criticize the disciples for their faithlessness and cowardice. But every honest believer knows that at times he has run from possible embarrassment, ridicule, or mockery because of his association with Christ. We have to confess that we, too, have left our Lord and fled when the cost of discipleship has seemed too high. Just as there are common marks of false disciples there are common characteristics of defective disciples, as the eleven proved to be on this occasion. First of all, they were unprepared. All of them, including the three Jesus chose to accompany him into the garden, had fallen asleep at this time of Jesus' great struggle. Because they confused good intentions with spiritual strength, they were powerless when testing came. They were overconfident and felt no need of prayer. Had they taken to heart the Lord's marvelous promises in the Upper Room Discourse, J-O-H-N 1 3, 17, they would have had the divinely provided wisdom and strength to meet the crisis. But because they had paid little attention to Jesus' teaching and had neglected prayer, the disciples discovered they were unprepared and inadequate. It is an absolute spiritual law that a believer who neglects the study of God's Word and neglects fellowship with Him in prayer will be unprepared, cf. Matt. 26, 41. When testing comes he will be weak, afraid, unfaithful, and ineffective. A second mark of a defective disciple is impulsiveness. The eleven disciples, and Peter in particular, reacted on the basis of emotion rather than revelation. They did not look at the situation from the perfect perspective of God's truth but from the imperfect and distorted perspective of their own understanding. Therefore, Instead of acting on the basis of God's word and in the promised power of his spirit, they reacted on the basis of their emotions and in the weakness of their own resources. The believer who fails to saturate himself in God's word and to have fellowship in God's presence becomes a captive of circumstances. His thinking is based on the emotions of the moment, and his actions are based on the impulses of the moment. A third mark of a defective disciple is impatience. Because the disciples refused to take Jesus' truth and promises to heart, they became anxious and impatient when things did not go as they thought they should. They could not wait for the Lord's deliverance and so devised their own. Many Christians take the easy route of fleeing from trouble rather than trusting God to see them through it. Instead of trusting the Savior to deliver them, and in so doing to demonstrate His grace and power, they try to avoid trouble at any cost and thereby bring reproach upon Him. A fourth mark of a defective disciple is carnality. The disciples, typified by Peter, depended wholly on their own fleshly power to protect them. Because he refused to trust his Lord's way and power, Peter had nothing to rely on but his sword, which was pathetically inadequate even from a human perspective. When believers lose their fleshly weapons or discover those weapons are ineffective, they sometimes simply flee in desperation. The major participant in this garden scene was Jesus himself, and in Matthew's account we see his triumph even while his enemies were taking him captive. Through their evil plot to put him to death he would accomplish the divine plan for giving men eternal life. All of his disciples deserted him, and one betrayed him, yet the divine work of redemption continued to be fulfilled on schedule, precisely according to God's sovereign and prophesied plan. As the disciples' faithfulness decreased, Jesus' demonstration of power and glory increased. As the plans of his enemies seemed to prosper, 
the plan of God prospered still more in spite of them. It is not clear exactly when it happened, but perhaps right after Judas's kiss, Jesus took the initiative and confronted the multitude. To assure his enemies that he was not trying to hide or escape, and perhaps to strip Judas of any credit for identifying him, he said, Whom do you seek? When they replied, Jesus the Nazarene, he said, I am he, and at that those words they drew back, and fell to the ground, John 18, 4-6. I am he translates e.g. I me, which literally means I am, the covenant name of God, cx. 3, 14. The exact reason for the multitude's temporary immobility is not revealed, but doubtless it was caused by the overwhelming power of Christ. Although the Jews in the group would have associated Jesus' words with the name of God, on a previous occasion when he claimed that name for himself they were enraged rather than fearful and tried to stone him to death, John 8, 58-59. And that name would have had no significance at all to the 600 Roman soldiers. In addition, it seems almost certain that many of the men in that huge crowd could not hear what Jesus was saying. Therefore their instantly and involuntarily falling to the ground as one man was not caused so much by fear as by a direct, miraculous burst of the power of God. It was as if the Father were declaring in action what he had previously declared in words, This is my beloved Son, Matt. 3, 17, 17, 5 the multitude was able to rise only when God's restraining hand was lifted. Perhaps while they were still lying dazed and perplexed on the ground, Jesus again asked them, Whom do you seek? And they again replied, Jesus the Nazarene, John 18, 7. He then said, I told you that I am he, if therefore you seek me, let these go their way, v. 8, referring to the disciples. The multitude that night reacted to being cast to the ground much as the homosexuals of Sodom reacted to being struck blind. Those wicked men were so consumed by their sexual perversion that even in blindness they persisted to the point of exhaustion, futilely trying to satisfy their lust, Gen. 19, 11. In a similar way the men who came to arrest Jesus were so bent on their ungodly mission that they crawled up out of the dirt as if nothing had happened determined at all costs to carry out their wicked scheme. Though not to the degree of being indwelt by Satan as was Judas, the entire multitude was subservient to the prince of this world. Jesus had already unmasked the duplicity and cowardice of the leaders of the multitude when he asked why they had not arrested him earlier in the week. He not only had been in Jerusalem every day but had been the focus of public attention on several occasions most not ably when he entered the city triumphantly and when he cleansed the temple of the money changers and sacrifice merchants. In his confrontation with Judas, the Lord also demonstrated his majesty and his sovereignty. He not only had predicted Judas's betrayal but had declared that even that vile act would fulfill God's prophecy, Matt. 26, 21, 24. When the moment of arrest came, he faced it without resistance, anger, or anxiety. He was as perfectly confident of following his father's plan and of being under his father's care at that moment as when he performed his greatest miracles or was transfigured on the mountaintop. In his confrontation with Peter and the other disciples, Jesus demonstrated his perfect faithfulness in face of their utter faithlessness. While they demonstrated their absence of trust in the Son, the Son demonstrated his absolute trust in his Father.